tonight's conversation, Online Only, the Rise of Digital Magazines as part of that initiative. Um, I'm going to do very brief introductions for tonight's speakers, and then I'm going to get out of the way. Um, panelist are Susan Glasser. Susan was recently appointed editor of Long Form Journalism and Opinion at Politico, and she's the former editor-in-chief of Foreign Policy. During her tenure, the magazine was honored for online general excellence by the Overseas Press Club and won three national magazine awards. And she's also spent four years as co-chief of the Washington Post Moscow Bureau. Jacob Weisberg is the chairman of the Slate Group, where he oversees Slate, the Root, and the video site Slate V. Jacob is the author of In Defense of Government and The Bush Tragedy. And he's the co-author with former Treasury Secretary Robert E. Rubin of In an Uncertain World. He was previously a writer and editor at the New Republic, and he joined Slate in 1996 as the chief political correspondent and served as editor from 2002 to 2008. And ben, Will ben Williams is the editorial director of New York Media's Digital Properties, NewYorkMag.com, which is the online home of New York Magazine, as well as Vulture, Grub Street, and The Cut. Under his leadership, the sites have won six ma national magazine awards, including three for general excellence, and contributed to New York's 2013 win for Magazine of the Year. And moderating tonight will be Peter Beinart, who's immediately to my left. Peter was until recently, or will be for a few more months, the senior political writer at the Daily Beast, and soon he'll be joining as a contributed editor both the Atlantic and National Journal. Peter's the author of four books, including The Icarus Syndrome and most recently The Crisis of Zionism. He's an associate professor at the CUNY Graduate Center and at the CUNY Graduate School of Journalism. Um, one more bit of housekeeping. There's going to be an audience Q&A at the end. Normally we wouldn't need microphones to a small room, but in order to capture the questions, I'm going to put a microphone in the middle of the room. So please, if you decide to queue up and ask a question, do us the courtesy of using the microphone. Thanks. Uh, thank you all for coming. Um, I think we're really lucky to be here with three editors who uh, have been very successful both in the old world of print and have transitioned to having great success in the new digital world. So it can offer us a really interesting perspective on how it differs, what, what different skill set is required in order to create good magazine journalism uh, in this old and new environment. And that was kind of the, I wanted to start out with by asking basically a kind of broad question to all three of you. And Jacob, I'll start with you, which is um, uh, I remember when you were at the New Republic. Uh, I remember and, when you were at the New Republic. Right, right. Uh, um, I think you were too important to talk to me back then. Um, but um, uh, I was only an intern. But um, uh, you, you, know, you, had, you had already had a very successful career before this tsunami of change. And, uh, and um, I just wonder, when you look back over the course of, of your career, and what you were doing back then and what you're doing now, what you feel like has been lost and what's been gained? Uh, well, it's a, it's a big question. It's a really interesting question, um, Peter. I mean, I think uh, what has been, I'll start with the, the positive part. Overall, what's been gained, I think, has been tremendous opportunity for journalists and for journalism uh, in the way you tell stories, in the kind of audience you can reach, in your opportunities to use multimedia, integrate technology. Um, it's, a, it's a fantastic time to be a journalist if you are young enough or adaptable enough to really take advantage of the, of the, of the new tools. You know, so I think that the young people we have working, coming to Slate, you know, they don't envision stories the same way we did when we started out at the New Republic as you know, a piece of prose. They think, how can I tell this story with an infographic maybe, or how can I make a game out of it? And they can be inventive and they can really let the, the nature of what they're trying to do what they're trying to express dictate the form with this tremendous flexibility. And this is, you know, rough meritocracy where people who have talent mm -hmm. and who can, re can reach an audience all over the world, you know, the barriers to entry are all gone. I mean, it used to be when we started out, we worked at the New Republic because we didn't want to go through this, right? Mm -hmm. But you would, they would say, well, go work at a small town paper, mm -hmm. you know, ideally in a, in a, a quaint town in Vermont. Mm -hmm. And then if you do well there, you could get a job at a, you know, at a mid-level city paper. And if you do, do really well there, you know, someday the apogee of your career, you could maybe get a job with the Washington Post mm -hmm. or the New York Times. And you know, that's, all, that's all gone now, but it used to take years and years and years to think about maybe I could reach a na national audience. Now you can reach an international audience when you're when you're 20 years old if you if you write something, so that's all. I think that's all tremendously mm -hmm. positive. The thing that I think is, I don't know that anything has been lost. I think there's some things in jeopardy, um, and the things I worry about are the categories of journalism, uh, which are important to 
democratic society, which are essential to democratic society, uh, which don't have a strong independent economic base. So in particular, investigative reporting, international coverage, and, and Susan should really talk about that, um, and also local coverage. Those, when those uh, kinds of coverage were bundled together in newspapers with other things that did work as businesses, they had a sort of hidden subsidy, an implicit mm -hmm. subsidy. And these you know, great public spirited families, the Salzburgers and the Grahams and the Chandlers that owned newspapers in big American cities, found a way to actually very quietly mm -hmm. subsidize mm -hmm. those kinds of journalism. Mm -hmm. That subsidy is lost now, and I think we're in a period of transition and experimentation mm -hmm. where people are trying to find, figure out new ways to finance that. Uh, Susan, you also, you, you know, you in some ways have, con you know, you've done, you've, you were at the, at, the, at the Post doing opinion at the Post when it was still much more of a, a kind of a, a, a new, uh, a, a, a print world, and then you, your, your extraordinary success at foreign policy, I think, was about taking, in large part, as I saw it, is about taking a publication that was a relatively small niche publication and in print, and basically bl having the website kind of blow up. So, I mean, I used to read foreign policy all the time, never looked at the print version. Frankly, wasn't even sure. If, I mean, I, I knew that there was a print version, but it was the website that it gained so much, uh, kind of gained so much attention. And, um, and now you're kind of on the side of doing something which is primarily going to be digital at a place, Politico, that does have a print version but is identified very strongly with, with digital. So I wonder how you would answer that question in terms of as being, as being an editor who does politics, who does opinion, who does international, what do you feel like, uh, what are the new possibilities and what, what, what saddens you about what's been lost? Uh, well, first of all, thank you so much for having me. And I would say, you know, like Jacob, I'm an optimist more or less uh, when it comes down to it. This is, there's just no question to me that you know, we have more tools and better tools and, you know, just amazing abilities, not only to reach audiences uh, in the way that Jacob talked about, but just, you know, to have access to information to not just tell stories, but to have a kind of impact and a conversation that we could never have imagined. Uh, and when I started reporting when I graduated from college, I, I always told people this story. I worked at Roll Call newspaper, and uh, which covers Congress and that has now sort of been superseded by, by Politico where I, where I now work. And every week we used to get a pile of clips like this, this high from uh, a, a CQ service that no longer exists. Uh, and it would be sort of like little news briefs from the, the Waterbury Herald American about, you know, the congressional race in, in the 5th District of Connecticut and, you know, what, what happened, uh, in, you know, in an obscure house contest in, in Fresno. And sometimes they would be weeks old. And sometimes, you know, we, we'd divvy them up around the table and sometimes people would write little briefs about that. And, you know, imagine you have that all in real time every single day. I mean, it just, it's exploded the kinds of journalism that we even conceived of, you know, all of us, I think, at the, at the beginning of our career. So, of course, I'm an optimist when it comes to, uh, you know, is this a good time to be in journalism? But I, I, I actually, I, I do think that it's, it's not just the question of investigative journalism or, or things without an economic base, but, but sort of a broader bucket of questions that I've been thinking about lately, which have to do with this issue of, as media has fragmented, and I think wonderful new outlets have come in, like Politico or ESPN, to really own their niches or foreign policy uh, in, in a new digital era, uh, where is the common ground where stories that appeal to people in their capacity as citizens that uh, reach outside of the stakeholder audience, the specialist audience, uh, that are not a captive and a prisoner of the news cycle, but sort of reconvene us around, uh, you know, bigger ways and frameworks of understanding what those stories are. And I and I think that 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 hits at local news. It hits at, but it hits at almost any kind of news, even the kinds of news and stories and information that are that are very well populated, whether it's uh, business and and partially that's a function of how we, the audience, uh, are overwhelmed, uh, as I think we all are, um, with things to consume. And, you know, there's more journalism, better than ever. It's got beautiful bells and whistles. It's got graphics. It's got videos along with it. It's, it's, it's told in more uh, and varied ways than ever before. And so finding our own pathways to navigate this, to understand it, you know, I think 
this is a weird phenomenon that, that most of us never really could have conceived of where the problem of the editor, of the writer right now is, is also the problem of the consumer. Those are almost intermingled in a way that they used to be separate. And I think basically that means we've all become kind of journalistic entrepreneurs now, right? Uh, you know, <coughs> the people who are creating the journalism have to be much more entrepreneurial uh, than that old system that, that Jacob described, I think, very memorably. I mean, I, I remember graduating from college and having some friend of my parents in some suitably august position telling me I had to go work and, you know, maybe someday I'd get to Orange County and then maybe someday I'd get to, you know, the LA Times. And it just, it didn't seem very appealing. Uh, and now, uh, you know, that's a whole path that doesn't exist anymore. So uh, I'm bullish on it, but I also, I think that the challenge is pretty much uh, for any subject that matters, especially any subject that matters when it comes to uh, thinking about how the country functions, democracy. There's a big audience for things like international reporting. There's a big audience for trying to understand events from a global as opposed to a purely local perspective. Uh, but are we organized to put that content in front of people, to, to produce it in ways that don't purely involve you know, having sort of 25-year-old freelancers uh, you know, rocketing off with a plane ticket to Turkey and saying, well, don't worry, I'm going to drive in and cover the war in Syria, which is, which is a big problem. So I'll leave it at that for now. All right, great. Um, ben, it's, it seems to me you're, you have an interesting vantage point. You've been at the same publication for, uh, for I think it is 10 years ten now. Years, ten years. Um, but of course, in that 10 years, that publication has gone from being a very successful print publication to being a publication that, although still successful in print, is, is really uh, most known, I would say now, for having a very, very, very successful and dynamic website. And so I'm interested in how you would ask, answer the question of what's been lost and what's been gained, and also how your job has changed since you were an editor at the same publication. Um, and yet, I imagine that what, you're, that what you do uh, on a day-to-day -day basis is very different. Yeah, I mean, I think what I would say has been gained, and to kind of add to what Jacob said about the freedom and that you have to reinvent right now and, and what Susan said about the sort of huge flow of information that's out there right now is there's also just a lot more dialogue online, um, you know, both with the readers in the sense that you know, in, in real time, you know what your readers are looking at. Um, you know, you know what they're, what, they're, what they're reading and what they're not reading. You also hear from them in the comments sections um, about what they're enjoying and not enjoying. Um, and then there's also a big dialogue that happens um, on social media and, on, and among websites in real time now. So somebody writes an opinion column for the New York Times, that's going to be something that gets pulled apart um, in the course of a few hours, um, you know, on various websites in various places, and, and that's pulled apart by journalists, but there also may be, you know, people who aren't, the jobs aren't journalists, who also have, you know, some kind of authority who, who are weighing in as well. So you were talking about getting this pile of clips from CQ that's months out of date. That's like, forget about that now. It's kind of like in real time, all of this stuff get, gets debated, um, you know, between journalists and, um, and between uh, and with readers. So that's really kind of exhilarating, kind of seat of the pants kind of stuff. Um, and I think it makes, you know, any story you do is kind of inherently going to be more open-ended now um, in the sense that there's going to be a response to it in some way. Um, but also in the sense that, and here's where I get to what, something that I think you could say is, is a little bit lost and is a little bit different about what I used to do when I worked on the print magazine and what I do on the website is everything is just much faster now. Um, and, and stories are kind of, you know, you iterate stories now. Um, you know, you may put up a first version of a story and a second version and tweak it and then someone else will respond to it and then you'll add some more. Um, whereas, in a magazine, you know, there's kind of like a certain amount of, you have some time and there's a level of craft. Like when people are pulling together New York Magazine every week, or when I used to be working on, you know, the parts of it that I was working on, you'd be spending hours fiddling over, you know, design elements and, and making stories fit together and try, you're trying to produce something that kind of has a, has a, you know, a narrative as you, as you read through it and it's kind of an object that's, 
you know, sort of a somewhat finished object that kind of has a certain, a certain amount of beauty to it, you know, ideally. Um, and, you know, that's kind of, you know, I don't, it's much harder to do that online because you, have to, you just have to do everything much faster, mm. right? And there's a, the upside to that is that you have a much more open kind of process, a lot more dialogue, you know, built into everything you're doing. But, um, you know, if you pick up a, you know, copy of New York Magazine, flip through it, it's still kind of a beautiful thing to experience. Jacob, I wanted to pick up on this point about um, the fact that you can see so much more the audience reaction to things. Uh, you know, through comments, you know, in, 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 in myriad ways, you know, immediately you can be deluged by either a positive or negative response to something. And in some ways, sometimes the worst can be that you get no response at all. But I sometimes think back, you know, going back to our common, you know, the place that we both worked in the Republic. The New Republic was a liberal magazine that delighted in pissing off liberals, right? Uh, that was kind of, in some ways, its stock and trade, yeah. right? And sometimes I wonder whether that would even be possible today, because you, you, know, you could question whether it was the best business model in the world, right? Because the <laughs> liberals eventually just said, you know, to heck with it, we're sick of all this, you know? Um, but in some ways, I think it's also what people who liked the magazine thought made it interesting. It was, it was, it was, it was kind of, it was, its whole identity was not being um, subservient to the, to the whims and particular ideological prism of its readers. And I sometimes wonder, in today's world, if that kind of thing is possible, because the, the emotional intensity of hostility um, that you get, especially from your own side, through comments, through Twitter, and Facebook, and everything else, means that I, I sometimes wonder if it almost, you know, it, in, in, the, in, the, in writing about politics, it naturally inclines you to play to your audience in a way that you didn't as much when, the audi when you simply couldn't hear from your audience nearly as much. Yeah, that's interesting. Well, I mean, the first thing to say is, to, is you know, just picking up on Ben's point, I think it's that instant reaction mm -hmm. to what you do that, that is, spoils you about online and makes it impossible to contemplate going back to print right. after you've right. done it. Because you just demand that. I mean, if you've written a piece and right. an hour later there's not a conversation right. about it of right. some kind, right. you're like, what did I do wrong? Right. You know, right. And it's, that's why going, you know, after you've worked online as a writer, going back in print feels totally anachronistic. Because it's like if you write for a monthly magazine, you finish a piece and six weeks later people are going to write letters to the editor. You know, by that time you're on to something. You can't right. even remember what you wrote right. six weeks ago. Um, but I think you know, the, the kind of comment, the quality of comment has been a key preoccupation and it's one of the things that uh, online publications have really struggled with, gotten, made much, much better, mm -hmm. but still not solved. And, but one of the things you know, I think we learned about, and we started at Slate in 96 with a comment section called The Fray. And we didn't want, it wasn't edited. I mean, we, you know, you would take down things across certain extreme boundaries, like when people would make threats and so on. But, you know, we felt people should be able to use their, use profanity, have their say. We had our say, let them have their say. And one of the interesting things about it, and we had the, the way the fray worked and the way our commenting still works on Slate is, was by topic and by section. And uh, the more you had to know something to comment on a piece, the better the commenting was. Mm -hmm. Um, so the best kinds of comments were on things, if you would, we would write a piece about science or technology, or we had a, a poem in Slate every week. The comments on the poem were fantastic. It was like, <laughs> it was like free literary criticism people were doing, and nobody ever wrote anything negative. They'd say, this is a great poem, here's why I like it, here's some other poems. And uh, you, know, you could read it and think, God, they're just such nice people out there online, <laughs> reading on the web. But the, but the, poli the stuff I wrote about uh, politics uh, is <clears throat> the other extreme, mm. because you didn't need to know anything to have an opinion right. about politics. Right. And it was all about people, you know, expressing themselves in the most aggressive way and, you know, in the, in the most sort of vile terms. And so, you know, it's become a real challenge. How do you improve that? Mm -hmm. And the, the big change has been around identity-based commenting. So it was really when um, Facebook, this Facebook uh, product called Facebook Connect, mm -hmm. was first started to be used several years ago, where you used your Facebook identity across other sites. Mm -hmm. And so you would appear as Peter Biner, and so on the Slate commenting platform, for example, you have to log in in some way. Mm -hmm. you know, it, doesn't, it can be your Facebook identity, it could be your Twitter persona, it could, you could create a login for Slate, and it doesn't ha even have to be your real self. Mm -hmm. You can have an avatar and a fake name, but it's an identity. Mm -hmm. And what happens online is that people develop a stake in these identities, and generally they want to be thought of as smart, not stupid, they, you know, they'll, be, they'll be aggressive. Mm. Um, but it improves the quality of commenting a lot. It hasn't solved the problem. I mean, if you go into the you know, 
d discussion around political topics mm -hmm. on Slate or on other sites, it's, you know, it, it still can still be pretty rough stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but I think, you know, it's one of the areas where I've seen that really kind of getting the technology right mm -hmm. is how you improve the, the quality of the content. Um, it's not about, you know, telling people to behave or getting them to behave. Certainly, it, it, they're going to be, it, it's the structure you create that's going to guide their response to things. Yeah. Susan, you're, you're, you're actually must be making decisions about these things right now, right? And you're, you're, go, you're, you're taking a publication that has made its reputation on doing politics without any ideology, right? And has been very successful, I think, in, in being a place that's read in Washington and beyond by left and right and, and is considered to be an honest, relatively honest broker. Um, and you're going to now take this into the realm of opinion. Um, so how do you think about... The con about what kind of conversation you're trying to curate and, and, and how you're going to try to do that so as, not, so as to avoid the kind of things that, that Jacob was talking about? Well, I think that's a really important point. This is a better moment to be doing this in many ways uh, because of what Jacob is talking about. I think that uh, you really risked a few years ago a, a sort of polluted public space problem, and we certainly saw that at, at foreign policy in our initial stages when, when I was working together with Jacob. Uh, and uh, the truth was, it would, the comments were terrible in, in a word. I mean, you know, they were, there was no lovely literary criticism. <laughs> it was like, you know, anti-Semitic rants, basically. Uh, and I think that it's been a huge step forward to have uh, uh, Twitter, to have Facebook, not just uh, as a platform for signing in to comment on a thing, but much more importantly, I think, is to create that kind of community and robust conversation around uh, the articles and, and pieces as you release them and that you do have a sense of engagement with the journalism uh, that's not only instantaneous in terms of do I have an audience or not, but uh, where you do get the kind of feedback and back and forth uh, around stories that, that are really valuable and that I think um, hopefully will be particularly valuable in, in this new uh, venture, Politico magazine, which, which will be launching on Thursday. It will be in print six times a year, as well as online every day. Uh, and I think it'll be interesting to see how that conversation works in a site that uh, is known for news, for playing it straight more or less. It's not a site for Republicans or Democrats. It's, it's had a very newsy, if you want to know what's going on, kind of junky sensibility to it. I think that's a big asset. So I'm hoping that uh, in the same way that foreign policy aspired to be uh, nonpartisan and to be a convener of people who don't spend a lot of time around each other's opinions and ideas that we can do something similar uh, in, in the political world and in part to avoid a little bit the trap that, that you mentioned about the New Republic because I think that is a danger for some of these sites right now is that they become captive uh, of their audiences that especially the sort of uh, sites that have a strong political identity and uh, operating outside of that, having a platform and a public space be something of value for people. Uh, what we saw, we had a, a venture that was interesting at Foreign Policy called Shadow Government, and it was a group of former mm -hmm. senior Bush administration officials yeah, yeah. who were uh, commenting on uh, the Obama administration and its national security and foreign policy position from the very beginning of the administration, but from the point of view not just of Republican critics of it, but, you know, yeah, I actually had to sit across the table from the North Koreans as well. So uh, it's a much more informed kind of criticism. And what I always found was that the people I knew who worked in the White House, they read that more than almost anything else on foreign policy's website. And my own working theory of that, and sometimes they had read those blog posts before I had read them. <laughs> uh, and my theory of it was that they did so because it provided them something valuable, which was uh, an informed criticism these guys in the White House were probably not going to National Review Online or some of the <laughs> other places where the foreign policy critique uh, of them was being aired out among Republicans. And so I think it performed that kind of value. So I, I hope, again, that you know, sort of being a public convener matters. But just to go back yeah. quickly, I think to me, though, that's only part of the goal, you know, to have this conversation around what you're doing. And this does go back to the question of, is there any value left in that old-fashioned uh, print journalism, in laboring over getting it right, in uh, that sort of thing. And 
I keep coming back to the answer of yes, perhaps not, you know, we're all happy to let go of the sort of terrible space constraints of, you know, like, sorry, you got to cut 500 more words. And that can be debilitating in its, in its own way to live with the scarcity of the, the paper economy. <coughs> but on the journalism front, I, I do think that maybe it's just because journalists are lazy and it's an important organizing principle to say, like, we're going to once a week or once a month or once every two months force ourselves uh, to jump out of the crack cocaine of the news cycle and the instant feedback that comes with it. And we're going to pull back and we're going to say, wait a minute, you know, we want to do a whole special issue around a subject uh, that we're not covering every day. Or we want to take our scarce resources and we're going to go deep and we're going to do 100 interviews uh, on this subject and, and produce a different kind of journalism. And so part of my hope uh, with the new project is, is to do things like that, to pull out of the news cycle, uh, to maybe use scarce journalistic resources a little bit differently. Uh, that's a little bit of a different conversation than purely the question of you know, opinion and, and the kind of feedback you get uh, from doing an online publication. That's, that's why I like the idea of commingling these things. Mm -hmm. Ben, what is your sense, you were talking about speed, what is your sense about the appetite today for things that, um, that require you to be slow in some sense, in the sense that they're slow to produce, and they're also, they're slow to read in the sense that you have to, I mean, you know, we're all now in a world where we expect to, our reading habits are, so often are darting from one thing to the other thing, the minute something starts to, you lose attention to something, something. And I, you know, one of the things I've just noticed in my own writing is that I find, you know, sometimes if I'll write something which is, 4,000 words, you know? I mean, this is the irony because, of course, right now there are no limitations. But I find, just anecdotally, if I write something which is 4,000 words or 5,000 words, I feel like one of the dominant reactions I get just when I see people responding to it is, beware, this is incredibly long. <laughs> and I think, I remember a time when that might not have been the longest thing, you know, in a, in a given week's edition of a magazine, you know? I mean, it was not considered an excessive length. And, and there's also almost, I almost sometimes feel like in the response I get, and maybe this is, again, me just being an old fuddy-duddy, there's a kind of sense of almost like, well, that's indulgent. Why did he need so much space? I mean, he could have just told us the thesis, you know? Um, uh, and um, so I wonder, is, how do you, what is your sense of what the appetite is and how if this can still be, what it takes to still do this, whether it can still be done. I mean, the first thing I'd say is you shouldn't listen to those people because yeah. if you if you run anything that's longer than a couple of hundred words, there will always be someone who says um, too long, didn't read. You know, yeah. just kind of a that's kind of a reflex response. Um, but you know, on the flip side, there's now kind of a cult of um, longer right. longer pieces, right. the whole long form phenomenon, right. which has a whole little ecosystem supporting it. Um, you know, and the thing I would say about our magazine online, you know, we put all our magazine, all the magazine stories online for free, this, you know, consistently, you know, sort of week to week, month to month, um, the stories that get the most traffic are the feature stories. Mm. You know, I mean, not necessarily every single one, and there's things in other parts of the magazine that, that can get attention as well, but if you, you know, if you look over time at what gets the most attention, it, it is the feature stories. Um, and I think, you know, yeah, they, they take a long time to do, but usually, if it's a good feature story, it has some new information in it. You know, like, um, and I think people online are basically looking for new information. There's like a huge kind of sea of, you know, aggregation these days. You know, everybody aggregates in different ways. There's a lot of stories that kind of get passed around and passed around. Um, and, you know, one way that you get traffic is you put something out there that is new in some way. So it's got, you know, if it's a feature, it's probably got some reporting in it, you know, that you've uncovered some new facts that, you know, that haven't been out there before, or you've made a, you know, an entry into, you know, uh, a, you know some hot debate of the moment, or you've got an, an exclusive interview with someone and there's a whole scene and it's funny or, or whatever. So um, I think there is, you know, it used to be kind of a canard of the internet that people wouldn't read long I don't, I don't really buy that myself anymore, but I think what, you know, because oftentimes the longer stuff has, has more weight to it, has more depth to it. 
what you what I think is true is you have to justify the length. Mm. You know, like you can't if you do a four thousand word story and it's supposed to just be important because it's four thousand words, mm. but actually you're just kind of rehashing a bunch of stuff that um, got hashed out on online a week ago, and you're just coming along and doing your kind of you know fancy gloss mm. on what what anybody who's been following the debate has already heard, then you probably won't get noticed. You know, so you've really got to make. I think maybe. You know, back in the print only era, it might have been a bit easier to kind of get away, get away with a long, a long story that wasn't bringing much new to the table. But now you really have to, you have to justify those 4,000 words. Yeah. But again, the technology is a big factor. So people reading on tablets means they're much more willing. It's a comfortable way to read something that's 4,000 words. Reading something on a desktop at work was not so comfortable or natural. But on tablets, people would read a book. But I think, you know, Ben's right. I mean, the thing that, you know, I've always encountered, and it was a frustration in sort of earlier days of the yeah. internet, when things really had to be short because people were reading them often on slow connections, you know, on right. desktop. Um, ambitious, serious journalists want to go deep at least some of the time. You know, whenever I speak at colleges, people say they want, you know, the, the aspiring journalists, they want to do long-form journalism. We never called it long-form journalism, right? We just called it like the New Yorker. Right. But, but that's what, um, but that's, you know, that's, People at Slate don't want to just write thousand word articles. They like writing thousand word articles, but they want to then sometimes have a month to go really into something and produce something long. And we let them do that. And we found a way that works. And it actually, it's sort of a defensible activity. But how, I just want, how do you do it? I mean, you, you're paying someone, right? Yeah. So this, you, this person is taking a salary. They're a lot, budget item. And you, you know, you're the guy who has to look at all this stuff ultimately. And you're going to say in, that it's going to, you decide it's cost effective. You can justify basically sending that person off to be basically to spend a month doing one thing or two things as opposed to producing, how do you actually, I mean, how do you figure out how to make that work? Well, we've got a lot of different ways to justify it. I mean, one is it's sort of the, you know, the Google 20% time model where Google, they let engineers spend 20% of their time working on their own projects on the theory they're going to come up with things that are going to be valuable to Google and they're going to keep their employees really happy. Mm. That sort of turns out to be true for this too. Mm. So you say, go take a month and invent something great. You know, people figure out these sort of new forms of storytelling. I mean, the things people have done, you know, I mean, one of our writers wrote a, a kind of serial novel, and people have done amazing things with this opportunity. But it's also, it turns out, because these are prestige projects, mm -hmm. and because of the, the way the advertising market works and the hunger for novelty among mm -hmm. advertising sponsors, this gives us something every month to say for our salespeople to take out and say, you know, we're looking for a sponsor for this really impressive piece of journalism that we're going to be running over a week and it's going to be, we know it's going to be the highest traffic thing that week because it almost certainly is. David Plotz, who's the editor of Slate, who took over um, after I kicked myself upstairs, um, he came up with this idea and we called it, in honor of him, we called it the Fresca Fellowship because he drinks Fresca. Mm. And, um, <laughs> uh, and, he, and he's really pushed it and, and he's pushed it to the extent that he forces people to do it. Mm. And there's some, there are some journalists at Slade who've resisted it and who've had to be kind of, you know, made to do it and they've all been glad in the, in the long run. Mm. But it, it works and it's something that I don't think would have worked 10 years ago. Mm. Yeah, no, I think, okay. I mean, what we're really talking about is sort of the death of the middle in, in some ways, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, you know, and I think that that is an important point. I, I, we also had the experience that the biggest things that you do, it, it's not a question of word count anymore, but often the most ambitious things really do also produce the biggest traffic. You know, do mm -hmm. they produce that relative to some, uh, you know, cost benefit of analysis or whether that person had written 10 other, you know, blog posts? I, I don't know. But to me, I think the really ambitious things, do well. Uh, in part, you know, I think Jacob's point is well taken about probably technology enhanced uh, ability to read and consume these things. Um, and then, of course, we have this real time conversation going around all these subjects. Uh, so the fast things we all know uh, do very well. What I see as being much more problematic, thinking about like what do you assign for a new publication like the one I'm launching. It is that mid-range thing. It's the, it's the kind of thing that if you're servicing a weekly or a monthly magazine, that sort of feature, you know it's not going to be mm. you know, the sort of number one or number two piece, but you still were looking for a number three or a number four piece. I, I find that I have very little appetite for that. Mm -hmm. My guess mm -hmm. is that that's exactly the kind of reading that falls away. There's a newspaper equivalent to that as well, uh, which is the sort of... Uh, kind of mid-range, like two or three day, you know, 40 inch thing. Maybe I had a good chance on a slow day of landing on the front page with a story like that. Uh, but really, it wasn't a major revelatory piece of reporting. It was, it was a quick 
turnaround thing, but it was longer than you know a run-of-the-mill news story. And I, I think those are the kinds of things that are harder and harder to justify. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas I do think there's a sort of emerging big hit theory of uh, how to reinvigorate and keep uh, certain kinds of magazine journalism going. And, and to me, that might make it compatible with uh, the, the prolonged you know, afterlife of, of print magazines. Because in fact, the very best of the old print magazines were organized uh, to produce those, those kind of big hits. And that's what the editors are great at doing. Uh, the designers are great at presenting. We've also had a big resurgence of design, I think, in the last few years online. And so it's not just that we have new technologies like tablets, uh, which enable us to read longer pieces better, but um, you know, they, it looks a lot better, right? I mean, I, you, know, you feel a lot uh, more connected to those old values of a beautiful magazine now. At least I feel that way. Uh, than I did just a few years ago, uh, you know, when people were preaching, you know, like, well, design doesn't matter in the age of the blog and, and stuff like that. Um, people don't say that anymore, and, I, and some of these new things look, look very beautiful uh, in a way that I feel like, you know, preserves that, that, that craft uh, even as it's transforming it. So I totally buy the idea that if, if you write something which either has great new reporting or maybe even just some really interesting new take, a provocative take or whatever on you know something in the in the in American politics or culture um, that you know you can definitely you can you can m definitely make it worth your while and, and people can you can get a lot of attention. But I think just to go back to what Jacob was saying at the very beginning, and Ben, maybe you want to weigh in on this. Can you know we, you know use the word ambitious? You know, can you can that work if it's a really ambitious, extraordinary story about something that is not in the mainstream of what people are talking about about something that's happening in a town in Mozambique or something that's happening in a, you know, uh, in, a, uh, in a junior high school you know, in Staten Island or something? I mean, can, did, what about, um, are we really confident enough that we're saying that we're in an area where great, ambitious, provocative journalism wins out? Or it are, as Jacob, I think, was suggesting, are there these, these areas where the work can be as fantastic as you want and basically, it's never going to be able to be justified on a, by, you know, by market rules. I mean, can it happen? Yes. I mean, because I think there's a kind of huge ecosystem for sharing content now and bringing content to people's attention. And sometimes, sometimes it is surprising, actually, what gets, you know, what get pick, what gets picked up. Um, but it's all, it's all kind of an odds game a little bit, you know, the way you think about which stories you're assigning and you do have in mind what's going to get traffic and what's not and so you make bets and you think well this is more likely to get traffic and this is less likely to get traffic so sure you're probably going to be more likely you know you're probably going to be more likely to assi assign the story that is at the center of a news cycle as opposed to the as opposed to the one about the uh, the school in Mozambique or whatever. A absolutely. I mean, that, that story about the school, if it was the, um, the right kind of story and, and you could put a headline on it like a, that was like the, mo you know, the most amazing, inspiring story you'll, you'll, read, to, you'll read today, <laughs> um, it, may, it, it might happen, honestly. Like, um, it the is upworthy surprising. headline. It is, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, it can happen. But yeah, but the odds of it are not as good. Mm. And it is, you know, Susan, I think, mentioned the phrase cost-benefit analysis. And there is kind of cost-benefit cost analysis that has to go into this stuff because while your deeply reported story might get might be one of your biggest traffic getting things, it might also have taken uh, you know a magazine reporter like months to produce it. And um, in the same time, you might have been able to get if you kind of got lucky, you might have been able to get um, half as much you know half as much traffic or three quarters as much traffic with something that literally took someone five minutes to do. Right. And you managed to get it on the front page of Drudge. Um, and, you know, like our biggest story this year, I think, was um, Joe Hagen's kind of deeply reported piece on the, the Today Show. Like, um, it was in the magazine, uh, you know, a few months ago, kind of all the backstage shenanigans and so on. Very deeply reported, took a long time to do, got more traffic than anything else we published on the site this year. But then you can have something where, say, um, there was a, you know, Dan Pfeiffer who works in, uh, in the White House, you know, ac accidentally uh, tweeted a, a, a racial slur, the, the, you know, the other day. And we simply did a, you know, and he instantly deleted it. And we simply did a post saying this happened. 
and um, you know, someone like Drudge picks it up, puts it on the homepage, and you get, you know, not much less traffic than you got off the huge, deeply reported feature thing. So, and that was something that took months versus something that right. took like but 10 minutes. So what we try and do is kind of do a mix. You know, like we, on, on our website, we don't do a lot of a lot real long form stuff because we have the magazine doing it. But we, we, we have, rain, you know, we have a mix. We have some longer things, but then we do a fair amount of stuff that's like, look at this video, mm. you know, or look, look at this GIF, mm. you know. So we kind of try and put bets in all the different spheres at once and you hope that a, a decent amount of them pay off. In the world of old media, you had the luxury of not knowing, right? So the New York Times didn't have to face the truth about how many people really read the Albany coverage or how many right. people read coverage of Rwanda. You know, and you would suspect that in a lot of cases, those numbers were really small. And they still actually try to protect the newsroom from the information, That's right? I mean, it's late. We, everyone knows the traffic. Like, you write a piece, you know how much traffic <coughs> is doing in real time. At the New York Times, and I think it's still the Washington Post, they don't want you to know that mm. because they don't want the they don't want their editorial decisions to be driven by numbers. Now, I would say the more sophisticated approach to it is to know the truth and don't let it drive your decisions, <laughs> because you know you don't. I mean, it's hard to not be influenced by it, but just you know the, because you know fewer people are reading something that still may be a very valuable audience. Um, it may be an audience that you wouldn't get otherwise. You're doing it for a lot of reasons, you know, but at the same time, you want to be informed by people. I mean, this sort of, the data is, is there, and you would be foolish not to use it. It would be, crazy if, it, it would be crazy if it didn't drive us some of your decisions. Because yeah. yeah. you want people to read your stuff. Right. Right. You also right? don't, so you don't, if, you, if you have something you think is good, and lots of people read it, then by all means, do more right. of it. You it's know, also, you where, where you don't want to be is like, oh, we're putting this thing out into the world that we think is really horrible. But, but, you know, it, it gets eaten up by everyone. That's where, you know, if you start acting in bad faith, then I think that's where you want to First of all, there are certainly, one could argue that there may well be many sites on the internet that do exactly that uh, sure, strategy. There are. But <laughs> I think people are more sophisticated, though. I mean, Jacob is, is much more familiar with the, the business piece of this, but I get a sense that this conversation has advanced a little bit in a good sense over the last few years that, you know, just purely tracing after traffic uh, for, for a... a journalism publication isn't necessarily the path toward a successful way to, to monetize your product or your audience. And so if there's more sophistication about the value of relative audiences or of having a, a, a repeat audience, you know, loyal readers who are coming back to you as opposed to those dredge links, which, you know, many news sites, including Politico, certainly are you know, sort of dependent on them, but at the same time, there's a recognition. People tend to come in and out quite quickly. They bounce in and out. They probably only stay for the thing that is linked to. They they aren't part of the core, you know, regular audience for your site. So I do think there's more nuance and hopefully sophistication about what to do with this new data now that we have it. I also would caution and, you know, not to put too much of a damper on it, but I don't, I'm not sure how much of a golden age of coverage of Mozambique, you know, there really was. Uh, in the American media, and that you know there is a temptation, and it's it's a very understandable one, in the midst of this transformation, to to sort of lament, uh, mm, you know, totally. a, a golden age that was lost. But a, I think Jacob is is really right. Who was really reading it? Uh, mm -hmm. In the end, we were sheltered from that knowledge, and it, it likely always was appealing to a very similarly small segment of the population. Mm -hmm. And then, and then b, this goes back to the the bar is higher thing. Mm -hmm. Uh, if you could put that great headline on it and say, this is the most inspiring story <laughs> <laughs> you'll read today, which definitely would be the way to brand that story rather than a really interesting tale right. from an obscure village in Mozambique, <laughs> right. Right. Uh, which, which definitely would have a, a smaller audience appeal. But, you know, I, I think the answer is that, you know, you might just be forced to do a better version of that uh, than, than ever before, uh, not that a great version of that existed mm. in the past. Um, uh, well, let's open it up to the to the audience. Um, uh, I think some, uh, we're going to have microphones, and um, please make sure you ask a question and just direct your question to the person you'd particularly like to answer it. Um, well, I guess this is directed to New York Magazine, but all of you could answer. I, I read an article recently in New York Magazine that was very much a first-person article. It was about juicing. And rather than talking and providing the reader with information about the new juicing companies coming to New York, there was some of that. Mm -hmm. But the emphasis was on the right, the fact that the writer had always been into juicing products, and she interviewed people in the stores. And I just thought it was kind of curious, as a consumer, 
And I started to think, is that because in the online world, there's so much personal blogging, first person journalism? So how is that blogging culture influencing what you put into New York Magazine and what you were planning to put into your other publications? Is, is that what journalism is gonna be now increasingly? First person perspectives on these new companies coming to New York or some new service or some new political development? Um, I guess there's a couple of ways to answer that. I mean, I can imagine totally us doing a servicey thing about, you know, where are, the, where are the best places to juice, and we may well have done that in another part of the magazine at another time. Um, you know, in that story, she was trying to kind of do a whole take on what the culture of juicing means. Um, I think you're definitely right that people respond to first person. So um, I don't think I can say that particular story was a sign because of the internet and so on. But I think in general, first person stories, you know, they do flourish. They do flourish online, partly for economics reasons, like um, they don't require reporting. Um, and, you know, people, you know, people like to tell their stories, but it's also partly a reflection of the kind of more democratic culture of the internet um, in the sense that, you know, people want to hear other people's stories unmediated by a reporter sort of saying, you know, sort of putting a, a more distant voice on it. Um, you know, in terms of how the internet influences the magazine, it influences it a fair amount, I would say. Like, you know, our, it, we used to be a local magazine, um, and really our website is, you know, a pretty much national website, very much rooted in New York, but we definitely think nationally, and um, it used to be that everything in the magazine uh, had to have a local New York connection. That's no longer the case at all. The magazine is actually more national than it, than it ever used to be in a bunch of different ways. And then there's definitely more than ever before a certain amount of thought at some level in the magazine assigning process, not necessarily of everything, but certain things, you know, they might be thinking with one eye on the internet that this might do, might do well online and, you know, which could mean all sorts of different things, not just first person, but in all sorts of other ways. So there's kind of like a lot of back and forth that happens there. I'm just on Ben, on your first point, I mean, I think, you know, writing in the first person is, it's the tone of, of writing on the internet. It's because the digital journalism, you know, comes out of email and this direct, right. there's direct communication with the reader and the, and the reader, you know, before I wrote online, I never used the first person. And after I started writing online, I almost always used the first person. And it wasn't because I suddenly developed this huge ego, though that might have happened around the same time. It was because that's, <laughs> that's, that's what worked, you know. And um, it's, uh, it, it's, it's almost, it's sort of hard not to do that when you, when you write online. Somehow people, you feel like there's someone on the other side of the screen. Because they're responding it, it, immediately. Right, in you know, a way you don't, you have don't that, when yeah. you're picking up a magazine. The newspaper is written, you know, in a formal diction. There's no place for the personality of the writer. You know, there is now because it's come through online, I think, more than anything else. You know, the New York Times, even in print, reads, you'll find the first person and people writing about themselves in an experiential way much more, but not as the, the standard way of writing a news story. still has, doesn't have a place for that. Uh, any other questions? Other way. Uh, go ahead. I just wanted to know, as a reader of New York and Vanity Fair, that whenever somebody does an interview, we find out what she or he was wearing, the footwear, and so on. Vanity Fair more, because the ads are very close to where that interview is going to be. But it used to be you talked to people because they were interesting, important, had something to say. Uh, is this just a new policy that we um, really have to know what they were wearing? <laughs> um, I mean, I'm not, I can't comment on Vanity Fair. Um, I don't think. I don't feel like they we. Have better ads. I don't. No. <laughs> it may be. I. I don't. Honestly, I don't feel like we do that a lot. I. I mean, I definitely think that we. You know, we talk to people because we think they're interesting. Um, it's possible that clothes get mentioned sometimes, for sure. But I. I could be wrong. But I don't feel like that's in every story. It's definitely not a mandate to put that in there. But. I, <laughs> but I did wonder. You know, I was. Uh, I was just thinking back to the. The um, the interview uh, that um, was it Jennifer Senior did with Anthony Scalia right, right which got right. a lot of yeah. attention. Yeah, a lot of attention. And um, very long, seven thousand words. Right, it's <laughs> extremely entertaining. I would have gone longer. <laughs> right, yeah. right. No, no. It was a kind of just a wonderful like putting two cultures in a room and watching mm -hmm. them try to figure out if they could interact with one another. It, you know, um, but I it did make me wonder. You know, that this where what are the how we move towards? There is it seems to me that. There's a new kind of genre of interview that seems to, I feel like, have emerged more recently that was not, I don't think was there when I was 
you know, coming up in journalism, which is, which is much more attitude oriented, right? In which basically like the reporter, I don't remember when I was, you know, I remember reading reported interviews with, interviews with people, but I don't remember the report, you know, the interviewer basically when someone would say something that the interviewer saying, well, that sounds stupid, you know, <laughs> uh, and then that gets reported, you know, it's like kind of provoking the person or, you know, this, um, and I wonder, I just wonder, does that have anything to do with the internet? What, where does that, where does that genre come from? I see it in the Times Magazine, you just feel like I see it more and more. Oh, man, I can't, I don't, I, is it just I, maybe it's the more informal conversational it kind could of, be. You know, uh, I have a hard time you know, attributing that to the internet. It could be just people trying to make interviews more interesting. I, I mean, know, that's sort know. of the old, you know, the Rolling Stone interview or the uh -huh. Playboy interview uh -huh. format is this yeah. sort of long discursive thing uh -huh. where the where the interviewer is mm -hmm. is sort of a personality yeah. in the room. Uh, but the, but it, something has changed because I used to always hate that when people would do Q and A interviews because I thought it was so you know the journalist hasn't is being lazy and isn't doing the work of telling me what's important. Instead, they're making me kind of sift through this transcript mm -hmm. and decide. But now, sometimes I kind of like them. There, uh -huh. has, there is something that well, sort of can a, work get, about You get a real way. flavor of someone in right. a way that you don't in a, but it's true, we've totally rediscovered this long form yeah. interview thing lately, which you're right, you know, people have been doing it forever. It's the, you know, the Paris Review, the, yeah. you know, it's the oldest thing in the book. But yeah, we've had a bunch of, like Mike Bloomberg was a similar thing that got a lot of attention in really long interviews. So, and maybe, I don't know, we, we have a form online that we were doing where we would run on, on Vulture, like what we call transcripts. So the whole idea is you give the pretty much unmediated, really long, mm -hmm. really long interview. Maybe Adam picked up something from that. I don't know, <laughs> you know, so it, it, it may be in a sense that the, having the sense, having the ability to run really long online was kind of a reminder that it works in print as well. Yeah. Well, I think there's something to be said about uh, the authenticity of whether it's being first person and sort of identifying yourself and your biases, which I do think is, is more of an internet response to the question of we've exploded the false authority of uh, an old medium newspapers and, you know, sort of speaking to you with, with one editorial voice. And so now there's a lot more both proliferation of genres too, uh, just more diversity, right, in, in the kinds of things. Uh, that you're reading online. And then I, I think it's consistent with the first person thing, to me, is kind of about the, the transparency. Right, there's that ethic online. of the internet. Show us the like document, it's, it's, show us the transcript, let us decide right. if know we your agree bias, with your interpretation. Just disclose your bias, yeah. right? Yeah. You know, the, the, the notion, I think, that, that the internet broadly takes is that we're all hopelessly biased in one way. This is a very, you know, sort of embracing subjectivity mm. kind of a, a, a world uh, that we live in. And so therefore, just be upfront about it. Uh, whether it's choosing <laughs> or, or politics. Right. Susan, I wanted to ask. Oh, if there are more questions, you should just you should come to the microphone. Uh, otherwise, I won't know that you want to ask yeah. a question. So thanks. Sure. Uh, uh, this is a little bit crude, but uh, how how do you uh, on an <laughs> online publication? How do you make money? Uh, <laughs> uh, it's a very it's a very, very good question. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I I was wondering how they how they make money at print publications because it's a really expensive online publications. All the money goes into paying writers a little bit for technology. Do you make money at Slate? What, uh, our business is doing very well. We're um, we're uh, <laughs> the, the reason I the reason I can't quite give you a straight answer to this yeah. question as Susan knows because she worked for the same company. They don't break out our numbers separately. <laughs> um, and so I, you can, thanks to the uh, le legislation known as Sarbanes-Oxley, you can't, if you're at a public company, say that this part of the company is making money. But, um, Good dodge. What's that? <laughs> but, but I wish I could answer your question because our business is doing very well and we feel that it fundamentally works. Now, it took us a long time to get to the point where we felt that it was working. Well, what did you do to make it? Uh, uh, yeah. es essentially, the, thing, the biggest thing that had to happen was the, ad, the uh, digital advertising market had to mature, meaning more billions of dollars had to move from traditional media to digital media, which has now happened. Uh, and um, we had to get good at selling ads. But the, it's, you, there are a lot of online-only publications that are working well as businesses right now because there's a big market of digital advertising. I would prefer a business that also got revenue from readers the way traditional publications do because I think it's more secure. You know, you're not subject to the pressures and vagaries of advertising. So, you know, a kind of goal for us is to get away from advertising revenue a little more it to be a little less dependent on it. But the great thing, it's like, you know, people talk about when, when school spending ends up in the classroom, 
versus being sort of lost to the sort of intermediaries and the bureaucracy along the way. With online magazine, it all goes on to the it all goes on to the site. You know, it pays for the writers, it pays for the staff. That's all there is. There's no printing. There are no trucks driving around, and the cost is a fraction <coughs> of the cost of a print publication that has to be stapled and printed and stapled and mailed. I haven't started yet, so I have a good excuse. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah, the answer is you make money with advertising mostly, and as but, um, as Jacob kind of alluded to, the online ad, ad market is really competitive. Um, and so it's definitely true that more publications are kind of looking for other ways to make money outside of advertising and not just be reliant on that. So whether it's a conference business or whether it's kind of what the, the very trendy thing of native advertising right now where you're sort of creating ads for the advertiser um you know there's a few different ways that people are, are trying to kind of break out break out of the the ad business if i could just follow you mean and then you know paid has had a little bit of a comeback as well you know at least you know with the new york times and people like that subscribing, subscribing. right so that's kind of the question i wanted to ask you about right you guys are all at publications <coughs> that have not gone down that route right yeah. uh um, uh, but so Although Politico has. Well, Slate know, did it a long time ago. Very successfully. 1998. They, they, they have built a... <laughs> oh, with all the, with all the, 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 the specialized publications. Yeah, exactly. Right. And I right. think that's important right. To, right. To, to point out, actually. You're right. You're right. Good point. You're right. right. So, so the kind of main, main standard Politico you can get for free, but Politico has lots of niche publications that people are willing to pay for, especially because they're really valuable for their, for their business. So I'm, I'm, I, just, I guess I wanted to piggyback on the question a little bit and say, and ask a little bit of, if you, any of you have a kind of working theory of what kind of content uh, you know, readers are willing to pay for, what kinds of journalism is most likely to be able to sustain itself in a subscription model, and what will have to rely on advertising or philanthropy or, or, or nothing. Well, I think that's an, a good place to start, actually, is this question of you know, what's truly indispensable, what uh, is perceived, at least, whether it does or not, to affect your business's bottom line. I think that's where uh, it's easier to see what the kind of future is for uh, a really a niche uh, publishing company like Politico or um, some other one that, you know, it's a pretty big niche, so it's not, it's not like it's confining in any way, but I think it's, it's easier for me to see uh, the kinds of journalism that you can produce, a kind of original reporting that holds value uh, for people around specific subjects. Uh, you know, I think where there's a lot of understandable worry is in the more general interest publication, uh, the things that either make for uh, just a robust public uh, debate and discussion or that just sort of simply improve your lifestyle. Does it improve your lifestyle enough to uh, really warrant paying for it? Uh, or is there some new model that we're going to come up with for that? I, you know, so the question is, uh, we all understand that they're really specific targeted things that, you know, if you're a lobbyist for the healthcare industry, yeah, you're probably going to want to pay for, uh, you know, a real-time reported uh, healthcare newsletter that's going to give you everything that's happening on Capitol Hill and in the executive branch around healthcare, right? We all get why that makes sense. How does it support and fund and connect to uh, other levels of uh, revenue that a publishing company could have around things that, you know, say, pull back, like, like a magazine uh, to look at things like that are not in that uh, real-time reported healthcare newsletter, uh, which may have uh, seen the trees but missed the forest uh, when it came to Obamacare, for example, or the healthcare.gov rollout. We, kn we know people will pay for sports business and pornography. Uh, the question in is what, what, what do they pay? Actually, <laughs> actually, I'm not sure they pay that much for pornography anymore. Maybe just business. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But, um, <laughs> but I, think it's, um, I think it's changing, you know, and a lot of it is, I think people confuse two problems. One, the willingness to pay with the practicalities of paywalls and pay sites. Mm -hmm. Paying for content is still generally a really bad experience. You have a separate password on every mm. site. You know, you have to take your credit card out. It's, that's all kind of getting better, but still kind of miserable. But I think as the friction of that decreases, mm. the people are willing to pay for content they care about. Uh -huh. You know, people are willing to pay for print publication. People pay for the New Yorker. People will mm. pay for New York Magazine. Peop you know, but there's the question that the New Yorker, New York Magazine face, do you have a model that restricts the content to the people who are willing to pay for it, 
or do you try to make the business work with the much larger audience of people who will read it if it's free? Mm. And you know that's the bet Slate's made so far because we you, you fall in love with having a big audience. Right. And mm. the prospect, if you can make it work that way, right. you're not so eager to say, all right, let's have a much smaller audience. Right. Right. Okay. All right. Um, you all briefly touched on this uh, has to do with tablet editions. Um, do you think that and how it being a mid-range, is there a continued audience for having the monthly or weekly disclosed designed product that doesn't have the comments, not all of that, um, or do you think that in the future it will move on to where it's much more interactive? Um, I asked just working as a tablet designer right now, it's we're taking print files, converting it to that, and that's the model, but I was wondering if that's more of a reaction to print magazines wanting to be on different online services, or do you see that being the tablet itself um, being like a magazine product rather than commenting stories going up at different times? We have a great tablet edition that you should subscribe to. Um, <laughs> You know, I think you're right that it's kind of a dream of the magazine world that tablets are going to kind of allow us to have basically the kind of same experience that you have in a magazine, but on a computer. Like I think the way tablet editions are designed right now, they're pretty much a literal translation of, so you know, you flip through the pages and as you say, it doesn't have the sort of the interactive elements that you get on the internet. Um, it's like the walled garden model. Um, you know, there's a lot of different reasons to do it that way. I'm a, I guess I would, I would say overall, I'm kind of a skeptic that that's going to really be a long-term kind of business model that really works for, for magazines out, you know, out, I, I think, you know, I think the, I think the internet itself, all of the things that you can get if you're out, on the internet as opposed to away in this little corner that's separate from it. I think there's just too much added value that you, you get on the internet. It may be that you can have both, like, you know, I think the way the New York Times has done their paywall is very clever and that you can, you know, you can subscribe and get a tablet edition and, and then you can get, you know, the stories on the website. I think, you know, when you have that kind of integrated suite, I think that works pretty well. You know, I think for a magazine to just try and put a subscription edition on a tablet and not do anything else is probably not, a, you know, not going to pan out that well. That's, that's just my opinion. And the idea that you have a digital product that, you know, isn't updated, doesn't have commenting, doesn't have all the functionality which people expect on the web, mm. you know, it, it, I, I think it, it doesn't work. And magazines, as, as Ben said, sort of, you know, cling for this, to this as a way to kind of retain or extend what's essentially print circulation. Um, but I think the tablet, experiment reading on tablets is, that's, that trend is going to continue. But I think what people are reading, you know, it's interesting if you look at the, there are two kinds of apps, right? There are what are called the native apps, which are the things you buy through the Apple App Store that are design products and you go into this walled garden and you can come out when you come out, but you don't interact between that and the rest of the internet. And then there are web apps, which function much more like websites. So it's, it's, a, it's a website optimized for a tablet. And the audiences for web apps are much, much larger. But interestingly, they're more like web audiences. People come, they graze a little, they go somewhere else. They come, they come more frequently and stay for a short time. The, the native apps, which are these replicas of the print magazines with some bells and whistles, have much smaller audiences, but they're good audiences. I mean, people come and they spend a lot of time, you know, they'll come and read that app like a magazine. Go ahead. My question is in terms of the consumer, reader, reader, consumer. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, I, I loved read Wall Street Journal's um, weekend and daily reviews because for some reason, uh, it's, it's always get uh, the, the people who put there, they, they use, uh, they, they just bring the essence of what it is. I read other things, but I like them. Um, a couple of weeks ago, there was a, 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 a critique of Marianne Moore uh, by this young woman, this, this young critic writer. 
and uh, it was about a book written about Mary Ann Moore. Uh, in, and in the piece, it was Mary Ann Moore, the author writing about Mary Ann Moore, and the critique of the book, Three Women in the Peace. So when I'm reading the piece, it's just, I was debating it to want to follow, but the woman who was writing the critique was brilliant. And he was allowing the participation of the three women, but she was, but you notice that her, her work was the one who was coming out. It was like sort of virtuality. Do you think that in the future, uh, people are gonna start getting the whole use of the mixture of the medias, the digital and the, um, and the written or the, the, the way you, you, you manage, how do you, how would you manage the text in such a way that won't go one way or another, or periodically because of the new technologies, uh, it will be all digital and our mind will evolve along with it. In, in, in my, the reason I did it is because I follow Joe Quinnan on Saturdays in Wall Street Journal, and he has this way of getting out of in the well and then in the very sophisticated and academic. And then there was this also this piece written this last Saturday about uh, the woman who wrote the pulpit, uh, uh, the, pul the bully pulpit, uh, Kieran Wynn, Goodwin. And I love her. I read okay. also her I books. I want to focus in on the, the question. But my question. My question is, what do you think is going to happen with the text and the people we go looking for the quality where in the written, in the digital, or in the mixture of both, we're all going right. to keep on like doing this okay. juggling. Okay. All right. So I, I guess the question, I think this will be our last, um, the last question, uh, as I interpret it, it really has to do with this question of what, uh, what, what we're going to mean by quality in the, in the, new, in the, in the digital age, um, whether that's going to be different, uh, and, um, uh, or whether there's, there are basically some universal understandings of what makes journalism good that really won't be affected at all. Well, I mean, if you want to say what's quality in multimedia right now, there's this kind of little mini movement that, you know, people call snow falling, which is <laughs> based, there's a, you know, the New York Times kind of introduced uh, few months ago, I guess, was it? Um, a very ambitious multimedia feature about a skier called Snowfall, and it's very long text, you know, must six, seven thousand words, I don't know. And then a lot of a lot of interactive video and a lot of photos, and it's kind of you move down the screen, the video activates, and it's all very beautiful and you know, beautiful design. I mean, you, beautiful design, beautiful kind of uh, images and video. Um, and that was very successful for them, you know, like huge, huge readership kind of, you know, big deal was seen as this kind of, you know, wow, somebody did something new here. And so now everybody wants to kind of do that. Um, uh, and a lot of people are kind of trying to produce the same ambitious multimedia features. Um, you know, I guess my opinion would be the kind of the jury is still a little bit out on whether people actually just want to read the read the text. <laughs> and not get interrupted by all the video and stuff, you know, whether that's, whether that's something that's kind of um, a little bit, you know, the, the vanity of, the, of us, the journalists, wanting to produce this beautiful object, or whether it's something that people actually will spend a lot of time in and interact with, um, you know, remains to be seen. But that's where I would say quality is in, in multi, you know, multimedia online at the moment. Did you want to make final uh, No, I, I, I totally agree with that. Um, I, I do think that this is where we have these tools that we're still in early days in figuring out not only how to use them for our journalism, but how they interact with each other. I've always been a little bit of a skeptic right, of the bells too. and whistles mm -hmm. and, and feeling that, um, uh, you know, you should stick with what your core competency is or where your, your advantage is coming to it. There's a reason uh, that people go to CNN when they want to look at uh, video uh, coverage of news events and when they go to the New York Times because they want to read a story fundamentally. So I think to the extent we're embarking on a kind of convergence or a transformation, it seems to me that we're in very early days of that. Uh, that being said, uh, we have tried to experiment with some things like this in, in our new magazine and we'll try to uh, 
uh, in the next few days as we roll out the magazine, try to do some things that certainly have not been in the vocabulary of Politico before, which up till now has done, you know, they do some videos that are more of a talking head nature, they have some slideshows, they have some uh, news stories, but haven't really put those together uh, in narratives or uh, told stories uh, or used those forms uh, in the way that, you know, we're talking about with, with Snowfall. So it's certainly, it's been fun uh, for me as an editor to start to experiment with some of those things, uh, but I feel like it's early days. Jacob? I mean, uh, you know, printing and reading were, were married for 550 years. They just, they just got divorced about 20 years ago. You know, yeah, uh, and uh, you know, so we're we're not we're not very far into the post Gutenberg era, but you know, it will change. There's nothing more basic to human culture and civilization than than writing and reading. I think the you know the 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 decline of printing and the rise of other digital forms is you know is going to change everything. It's going to change the kind of literature that's going to be created. It's going to change, of course, the kind of criticism. It's going to change the way people read, how they read. You know, but it's. The good, the good news, if, if you find that a scary prospect, the good news is it probably doesn't matter that much to the people in the room because nothing that you're used to is going to go away completely that soon. You know, but 50 years down the road, I mean 20 years down the road, we're living in a very different world. 50 years down the road, we're going to be living in a very, very different world. Um, but you know, I don't think it means that people aren't going to write, aren't going to create literature, or aren't going to create criticism, aren't going to create poetry. It's just you know, things are it's going to evolve with the technology. Uh, with that, we're going to close. Uh, thank you very, very much, Ben Williams, Susan Glasser, Jacob Weisberg, and thank you all for coming. Really appreciate it. <laughs>